So today we are joined by the one and only Harsha Walia, a good friend of the Red Nation. Uh, Harsha is a migrant justice, uh, anti-capitalist, feminist, abolitionist, and anti-imperialist uh, organizer. And she's also the author of the award-winning book, Undoing Border Imperialism, which has been foundational to the politics and the thinking and the organizing of the Red Nation. And today we're going to talk a, a, about her new book called Border and Rule, uh, which just came out through Haymarket Press. I actually wrote the the uh, the afterward small plug, uh, <laughs> but it's a, it's an amazing book, and we we definitely want to get into the book. But as the Red Nation, we've been following closely your coverage, Harsha, of the farmers' movement in India, and we haven't actually talked about it on you know the show, but it's such a profound uprising. 250 million people are engaged in, in mass protest, and yet there's nothing in the news in places like the United States. It gets small coverage, and it is possibly the largest labor strike in the history of the world. What should we know and understand about this movement? What is the history of it? Who are the main organizers? And what are the takeaways for organized labor and movement building? Yeah, thank you for that for that question. And I have to say, it's such an honor to be with the one and only comrades of the Red Nation, whose work hugely influences and, and inspires me. Um, and thank you both, Nick and Jen and everyone else at the Red Nation, um, who just, you are so profound in all of your work and in your internationalist vision and the ways in which you lift up struggles for indigenous sovereignty and for, for people all around the world. So it, it truly is an honor and I should say that I'm I'm speaking to to you two uh, from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people. These are the lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and, and the Squamish people. Um, and for me, as you mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of my work is in in migrant justice struggles and really thinking about the ways uh, that when I came to these lands, what it meant to pledge allegiance not to the Canadian state but to the Indigenous nations whose lands I'm on and the laws and the jurisdiction that continues to live here on these territories. So just, I wanted to uh, just say where I, where I am uh, and where I'm coming to this conversation from. And also I'm coming to this conversation by way of, of the Punjab. So thank you for, for asking about that. Um, my family is from the region of Punjab. Uh, that really is at the epicenter of the farmer struggle right now uh, in India. And as you said, you know, this is one of the largest uprisings in the world, uh, certainly in, in the country and has sustained itself um, in this immediate context, right, for uh, just the through the winter months. Um, and people are camped out surrounding the borders of New Delhi, the capital of India, in resistance to three farm bills. And I think what's important, if I was to summarize uh, some takeaways, the first is that, you know, these farm bills in the immediate, what they do is increase private control of the farming sector. Um, and, you know, there has all there's already been a long creep of privatization and corporate control of farming in the Punjab. And these three laws just kind of expedited that process, making it easier for multinational corporations um, to basically um, exploit and extract both land and the labor of farm workers. And so that is the kind of impetus for this resistance. But also, it is not a coincidence that these farm bills that impact, you know, the entire country and, and farming communities across the country, but that the resistance was really focused in the Punjab, because the Punjab has a long history of opposition to the Indian state. Punjab, at its very founding uh, or rather its founding in the Indian state was marked by partition. Uh, so Punjab has been marked by one of the bloodiest human displacements in human history already, which was the imposition of the colonially imposed border between India and Pakistan that fractured the Punjab into, into two different regions and really violently forced people on two sides of this artificial border. So it's always been in a struggled relationship to the Indian state, what it's what it calls the center. And then, you know, decades, decades on the Green Revolution, which was really an industrialized revolution um, that brought in capitalist control and industrial control of the farming sector, that kind of industrial World Bank funded ex neoliberal experiment at a global level was was pioneered 
in the Punjab. So Punjab has, you know, the impacts of that are what we often hear about in the news, you know, farmer suicides, a substance use um, crisis, the crisis of landlessness that all kind of flowed from uh, the, the failed and flawed experiment of the Green Revolution. And then in the 1980s, you know, there was a, a massive counterinsurgency and anti-terror campaign and genocidal campaign against the Sikh community um, in India as a result of the assassination of then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. And so, you know, all of these kind of overlapping forces are the contextual kind of factors that have fueled the current struggle against farm bills. And then um, the other uh, really important context is that the Punjab has one of the largest Dalit communities in India, um, Dalit communities being caste oppressed communities who are more, more likely uh, than caste privileged communities to be impacted by landlessness and to actually be farm workers and not farm owners. And so one piece of um, one kind of one piece of important solidarity uh, or one important aspect of solidarity that's been built in the current movement is uh, the kind of solidarities as tenuous as they are and as troubled as they are between farm owning and farm working classes and farm owning and class and farm owning and farm working castes and farm owning and farm working communities. So all of these are, I think, um, some of the most important aspects of, of this resistance and really just the direct action that has been imbued, both the organization and the direct action and just the fearlessness that has been imbued throughout this resistance, um, facing down state violence again in the middle of winter and remaining undeterred um, and, you know, just suffering so many deaths. The, the deaths are over 120 farmer deaths in the past two months alone from various causes. Um, and so I, I thank you for bringing this up because it's certainly been close to home and close to my heart um, in many ways. Thank you so much for that, Harsha. Wow. this That was some incredible context that I think a lot of people have been waiting to hear and, you know, don't hear really anywhere else. So thank you so much for that. So I wanted to ask you about your work as an organizer. You know, how did you get politicized and what are some of your current projects? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, <laughs> it's always the hardest one to answer in terms of how I got politicized because I, I don't think it was one singular moment, if you will. And, you know, perhaps the same as most other people, a mix of uh, you know, personal and, fam and family histories, and also just observing the world. And I really do truly believe uh, that most of us, you know, hit a point in our lives where we see the things that are around us, and we make decisions, right? We make decisions, and of course, informed by our lives, but we do make decisions about what we're going to do about what we see. And some of us kind of tell ourselves that we will accept it, or we can't change it, or we normalize it. And others of us just decide that that's not acceptable. And I don't mean to be so simplistic and individualistic about it, but I, I think that's that's part of the equation. Um, and so, you know, for me, as I mentioned, some of the my family histories were are these fractured, really, you know, fractured histories, I should say, because um, as many of us likely know, our kind of elders' relationships to trauma means that we don't always know our full histories. But in as much as I was able to gain those oral histories, those stories, as it related to partition, as it related to what happened in the 1980s, as I mentioned, I also have family members in my immediate family who are migrant workers. And so I very much remember the immediacy uh, and the fear of literally being deported with no notice, right? With two hours notice, and you're suddenly completely expelled from your life. And so all of those informed um, my understanding of the world. But really, I would say it sharpened um, in the, the, post the kind of era of resistance to globalization, to corporate globalization, the, the late 1990s, uh, with the WTO protests in Seattle, the protests in Quebec City in 2000, and, in 2000 2001. Um, and, you know, that kind of internationalist spirit of uh, fighting capitalism. Um, and then right after that, you know, how it dovetailed into the post 9-11 era um, and, you know, the ways in which uh, racism escalated, of course, not new, but escalated 
under this new framework of terrorism, um, the targeted surveillance, the deportations, the detentions, the interrogations. Uh, and again, you know, that same witnessing and supporting people through that violence of, of being terrorized, right? The war on terror was a war of terror and continues to be. It's a never ending war. Um, so, you know, those were some of my politicizing moments. And of course, like all political education, it, it never ends. And I've continued to, to learn. Um, when I first came to North America, uh, one of my mentors that I met was Ellen Gabriel, who was the spokesperson in the crisis in Ganawage and Ganasatage. Um, and I had the huge privilege of learning from Ellen um, about the, you know, about the importance of indigenous sovereignty, which is why for me, it's, it's never really been a contradiction or a conundrum uh, that as someone fighting for migrant justice, I would also be fighting for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination. And that those, while those struggles may seem distinct, they are in fact intertwined in many ways. And most importantly, that those networks of kinship and those networks of responsibility and relationality uh, have deeply motivated me and, you know, continued in my work in politicization, being involved in supporting struggles in Wet'suwet'en territory, in Chukwamuk territory, in Mi'kma'ki, um, and many other land defense struggles. Yeah, the, this book is definitely a continuation of those kinds of uh, political projects and the conversations. I feel like that's really what this book is, is a, is a conversation among movements. And there's a lot of movement derived theory. And I think that, you know, you're very good at like the citational politics of where you're drawing a lot of this, um, you know, these ideas and these arguments from, um, you know, we're in an interesting moment, you know, this book, A uh, Border and Rule was published during a global pandemic. And we're seeing the restoration of the Obama of Obama era neoliberalism, which isn't to say that Trump wasn't a neoliberal <laughs> by any means. But there seems to be a sense of hope and optimism about the Biden administration and his restoration project of the of the Obama era policies, whether it has to do with the environment or whether it has to do with, you know, so-called immigration. So, for example, Biden lifted the, the, the so-called Muslim in Africa band. He's also uh, rescinded Trump's limits on immigration and work visas. Uh, and as you point out in Border and Rule, however, you cannot divorce the kind of domestic, you know, quote unquote, immigration policy with Foreign pol with the foreign policy of the United States, which is you know grounded in imperialism, so in many ways Biden's foreign policy is the same as Trump's, but other in other ways it's different, and and in some ways it's kind of more aggressive, you know, especially towards Latin America. What do you make of the Biden presidency, and what do you want leftists and progressives to understand? What's different? What's the same? What we are missing, and what we should be most concerned about? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. And I would expect nothing less from from the Red Nation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's precisely it, right? The false optimism um, is one that is, it's, it's that, it's false. Um, and it's a, a politics, a failed politics of centricism, of neoliberalism, um, and really one that erases the ways in which you know, even though it may be a matter of scale, right? Like say Trump's overt white supremacy or his overt xenophobia or his overt right wing ideologies, while those may be less overt in centrist administrations like Biden, the systemic nature of the state remains the same. You know, whiteness is, is the state, settler colonialism is the state, imperialism is the state, and more, you know, carceral, the, the state is carceral. And so that remains unchanged. And I think the biggest danger, of course, is that sense of ease and false optimism, right? Um, where we suddenly say, all right, like, we don't have work to do. Um, and, you know, there's, there's nothing to worry about. This, the, we can work through the administration um, to make change or, you know, have faith in the administration to make change. So that's, you know, that's a, that's a false promise. And I think when it comes to immigration in, in particular, you know, there's just a long record of how some of the worst immigration uh, in the U.S. context, some of the, the most oppressive and punitive infrastructures of immigration enforcement were, in fact, implemented by the Democrats, right? Whether that's the Clinton era, both in terms of the impact on the prison industrial complex, as well as the impact on the rollback uh, of the welfare state, 
and the punitive agenda um, that was anti-migrant, right? Like all three of those um, were not just inherited from Reagan and Nixon. Those were solidified also in the Clinton era. Um, and, you know, the massive expansion of, of the carceral state that certainly was born in the era of the war on drugs under Reagan and Nixon, um, but really were also escalated under the Clinton administration. And, you know, it, it was the Clinton administration who finally signed off on NAFTA. And, you know, that's the link that you're talking about between, you know, foreign policies and domestic policies and how that, that, that they're synchronous, right? They, they feed off of each other. And, you know, it was the exact same time that uh, NAFTA was being signed that Clinton also signed off on uh, the, the first kind of prevention, uh, deterrence by prevention policies, right? Starting to militarize the border, knowing full well that NAFTA would create a crisis of displacement that we know the Zapatistas, that was precisely one of the reasons that they rose up against NAFTA, right? So the Clinton era really solidified that relationship between militarizing the border while at the same time implementing policies of capitalist free trade that would create displacement and migration in, in the first place. And, you know, with Obama, um, Obama was called deporter in chief uh, by migrant communities and refugee communities and undocumented communities in the United States precisely because he oversaw the escalation of border enforcement. And, you know, that really has, you know, the linchpin and or the cornerstone, if I may, of the Democrat immigration policy has been a, a technique of divide and rule. And so one of the things um, that Obama was, you know, so great at and arguably infamous for is, you know, as he was signing DACA, the, you know, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, which was lauded by many because it really played into the idea of, you know, who's deserving, um, you know, students without records, et cetera. At the same time that DACA was being signed, um, or just before introducing DACA, rather, Obama made this grand statement, right, where he said, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom who's working hard to provide her kids. Um, he signaled that, you know, he was implementing DACA because his enforcement priorities were elsewhere. And so his enforcement priorities became deportations of non-citizens who had criminal records, who migrated irregularly. And, you know, by, 20, by 2014, under Obama, half of all federal criminal arrests were actually immigration related. Um, and so, you know, this is the kind of trajectory um, of the liberal establishment, right? It's to try to rehabilitate the legacy, these terrible legacies of Obama and Clinton, and even, you know, some liberals are trying to rehabilitate the legacy of George Bush, but that it really erases the entire infrastructure, right? Like Trump didn't invent the infrastructure of immigration enforcement overnight, right? Like he inherited that infrastructure. Um, and, you know, people may recall as well that some of the photographs of children in cages that were circulating um, to kind of showcase the horror of Trump's presidency were actually taken during the Obama years. And so I think it's, um, it's really important to remember that the kind of border arsenal that Trump inherited and escalated were built up, were built up um, by Democrats and centrists. And so, you know, that's just in the realm of immigration, but we can, of course, make that argument for the prison industrial complex, for the carceral state. You know, Obama also perfected drone warfare uh, when it comes to imperial policy and foreign policy, right? That just in the U.S. dropped 26,000, over 26,000 bombs. That is an average of three bombs every hour um, in Obama's last year, right? And he got the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, so these are these are the kinds of the kinds of violences that I think we just cannot let up. Um, and challenging and confronting, nor can we be myopic about it, because, you know, violence is, is bipartisan practice in the United States. Right. And you do such a good job of, um, you know, focusing on the arbiters of violence rather than the spectacle of suffering that you just mentioned, right, where terrible graphic images are kind of used strategically by these news outlets to convey one thing at one time, but then go back on it at another. And in the, in the introduction to the book, you quote Vivek Shreya 
posing the question, why is my humanity only seen or cared about when I share the ways in which I've been victimized or violated? And this is a really profound question. And the book itself can be heavy at times for how it documents the sweeping geography of carceral and military violence leveled at migrants. But um, you're someone who doesn't dwell on the violence or the spectacle of suffering, right? You practice and preach a profoundly different politic, one that's grounded in revolutionary care and empathy. But today, there seems to be a way that the neoliberal way of creating legible politics is always through injury. So how do we move toward a more affirmative politics, one that's based on the horizons of struggle of what could be versus the nightmarish realism of Mm. what is, that this current system doesn't offer a real alternative? Yeah, what a good question. Um, Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's exactly as you pointed out, right? It's kind of this, um, a bit of a conundrum, because on the one hand, we don't want to um, minimize the violence or sanitize it. But at the same time, we know that the spectacle of violence is in itself a form of violence, you know, and I'm reminded of, you know, Sarah Ahmed, who writes that, you know, empathy sustains the very difference that it may seek to overcome. And Claire Hemings writes on how, you know, that spectacle and consumption of violence can become a cannibalization masquerading as care. And, you know, Tamara Noper and Mariam Kaba have also written specifically on the the, the focal point of anti-Blackness um, and the spectacle of anti-Blackness as a kind of focal point of, of violence and how spectacle is the route to empathy, they write, means, you know, atrocities have to continue to be itemized and have to get um, happen more often or get worse. And, you know, they write, they wrote that in a, in a fantastic piece on itemizing atrocity. And so there is this, this kind of um, interplay between needing to document violence, because I think witnessing um, and paying attention to violence is important, so as not to erase it, but documenting and witnessing, I think, is different um, than creating a spectacle or being voyeurs into it. Um, and I think for me, the key uh, difference there is exactly as you pointed out, it's it's the care and it's the action, right? That we don't just become silent uh, voyeurs to violence, but that we um, that we document violence in order to fight back against it. Um, and that we we do it as a way to honor uh, lies that we've lost. And for me, my thinking around that, um, and, you know, thank you, uh, for talking about, um, rooting it in revolutionary care and empathy and, you know, how to push back against the neoliberalization of it through the politics of injury really comes from the February 14th women's memorial march. Um, and, you know, the February 14th women's memorial march Uh, happens in communities across these lands and started exactly 30 years ago. This this year, February 14th, is going to be the 30th year. And it started in the downtown east side of Vancouver in response to the ongoing and horrific violence of Indigenous women and trans and two-spirit people. And, you know, every year, led by Indigenous elders and women and trans and non-binary people, that march holds all of that together, right? Holds, refuses to forget the lives of women who have died in the downtown east side, comes together in an act of love and remembrance, comes together in an act of commitment to justice, of kinship. Um, And for me, it is, you know, the ways in which that space um, and that march and everything that leads to that march, it's not only about one day, but the 365 days a year, um, where the practice of bearing witness and the practice of revolutionary care and the practice of resistance all come together in ways that fight back against the neoliberal way of creating spectacle and is grounded deeply in, in a politics of reciprocity and uh, a politics of remembrance. And I think, you know, remembrance is really what is different than neoliberalism because neoliberalism is a politics of commodification and spectacle. Remembrance is an act of honoring. Um, and I think for me that that is a way to hold um, to hold that together. 
Border and Rule is really an incredible uh, project because of its scope and outlook. And, you know, it's truly global and internationalist in that way. And, you know, it's, it's fascinating because, you know, in movement spaces, there's always this bizarre, you know, nagging antagonism, uh, whether it's real or imagined, I think it's mostly imagined, uh, around Indigenous and migrant politics. On one hand, there's a very serious accusation that Indigenous sovereignty is somehow, you know, quote unquote, anti-immigrant, uh, which assumes many things that, you know, migrants can't be Indigenous or whatever it is, you know. Um, uh, or on the other hand, you know, Indigenous movements get siloed off into just being about, you know, the environment or uh, their local parochial st struggles. And you've written extensively about forging these connections along the axis of border imperialism. How do you see Indigenous-led decolonization movements and more recently, you know, the struggles under the banner of land back intertwined, like fundamentally intertwined with migrant justice and undoing border imperialism as more than just a kind of, you know, local struggle or a national outlook, but one that is truly like global in its in its approach. Yeah, and I think um, that's exactly it, right? I think if we start to take an internationalist lens to politics in general, then some of these seeming contradictions really do fall apart because some of these seeming contradictions are by, very, are by their very nature kind of state-mediated, right? Um, like the category, exactly as you pointed out, like uh, presumes that, for example, indigenous people are not also migrants. Um, or, you know, we're talking about NAFTA earlier, you know, the largest increase after NAFTA in terms of proportion of people who were on the move and displaced as a result of NAFTA were indigenous peoples. Um, and so, you know, it's it's exactly those kinds of um, seeming contradictions that 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 fall apart when we start to think in these internationalist ways. But I think especially in um, settler colonial context and here, you know, I can uh, talk about the U.S. again, uh, is that it also ignores the ways in which the border was actually enacted and constructed explicitly not only against migrants, not only to exclude migrants, but also to enact anti-Black and anti-Indigenous genocide, right? Like, but now when we think about migrant justice movements, we think about uh, about the border is only impacting migrants, right? That it is a form of violence um, against migrants who are deported, excluded, um, you know, have uh, are, are undocumented, their ICE raids are conducted against them. And that is all true. And that is um, part of the work that I wanted to do and intend to do, and I hope I did, in Border and Rule, which is to show that, you know, if we, and just looking again at the U.S. border for, for a moment, um, that the violence that's inherent to the border cannot be disentangled foundationally um, from anti-Black and anti-Indigenous genocide, that they are, they are made through each other. And that, of course, is, is most obvious in the very formation of the U.S.-Mexico border, which is a border that came to be as a result of conquest and the U.S. annexation of territory, which is indigenous lands, right? Indigenous lands that were seized, um, you know, the Comanche, the Apache, the Sari, Kiowa, so many more nations whose lands were seized and were forcibly assimilated into the U.S. nation state in order for the U.S.-Mexico border to even be created, right? 5,500, over 500,000 square miles of territory uh, suddenly captured by the United States. And that very act of creating a border on indigenous lands across indigenous nations is an act of violence against indigenous peoples. And the other ways, you know, there's some very specific ways in which immigration or immigration policy in the United States was also enacted to limit um, both the migration of indigenous peoples across these artificially created borders and also so to solidify citizenship as a as a form of settler capitalism, right? Um, and, you know, if we think about, and Nick, you've written about this, right? The Dawes Act, and, you know, the, the Dawes Act is an act of, of land theft. Um, but one of the things that has always struck me about the Dawes Act and similar acts in Canada is that not only did it steal Indigenous people's lands, but also it forced Indigenous people to become citizens, 
of the U.S. state, right? And, you know, under the Dawes Act, Indigenous people were not only forced to relinquish collective land title and assimilate into the the settler capitalist economy, but citizenship, quote unquote, U.S. citizenship, was dependent on the legal regime of private property. So we see this kind of convergence between um, citizenship as a settler, colonial, and capitalist concept, and how indigenous peoples became part of um, of uh, and and were oppressed in the context of of the creation of the border. And you know, in in that in the same a few years after the Dawes Act, like the Indian Citizenship Act imposed U.S. citizenship on indigenous people, right? So immigration and citizenship was used um, to deny indigenous sovereignty in the, in the same kind of ways that citizenship was used to deny racialized people the ability to migrate, right? It became, um, you know, free land and free citizenship for settlers. Those were part and parcel of the same project. And also, you know, one of the ways in which immigration enforcement was first enacted in the United States in the early 1920s was actually against Cree and Chippewa people who were indigenous from so-called Canada who were crossing into the United States in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And they were in really strong political battles for federal tribal recognition in the United States, but were actually subjected to immigration policies of the United States and were deemed, quote unquote, foreign Indians and, quote unquote, deportable illegal immigrants, despite being indigenous people. Right. So I think these kinds of histories are important because they show us um, how indigenous sovereignty and migrant justice struggles emanate from the same source of border violence. Right. And of course, you know, in the present day, as you mentioned, to think about the number of indigenous peoples who are impacted by border enforcement, right? People who are migrating from the this, this, uh, nation states of Mexico or coming from Central America who are, who are Maya, for example. And I know that, you know, Red Nation has paid tribute to the many Mayan people who have died at the hands of border enforcement in the United States, right? And so I think thinking about those relations um, and thinking about the histories of the formation of the border challenges challenges that. And then further, that kind of internationalist view on, well, who is being forced to migrate, right? Who are indigenous people um, around the world who are being forced on the move because of settler state policies of expropriation, um, genocidal uh, massacres in countries, um, all of the capitalist trade agreements, all of the kinds of um, internationalist imperial forces that force people on the move overwhelmingly impact indigenous, black, brown, racialized, poor people, caste oppressed people. And in that way, the movement of people, Shannon Speed writes about this, right? The movement of indigenous people between settler states doesn't suddenly erase that they're indigenous people. They don't, you know, inherit a new identity only as migrants. Um, and so I think those kinds of um, contradictions that you speak to, uh, I think the kind, you know, if we think about it in that expansive way, they kind of fall apart a little bit more. And I'd say most importantly, the last thing is movement organizing, right? <laughs> Sometimes these kinds of debates can seem abstract, like, oh, indigenous is opposed to migrant because, you know, one is about being on the move and the other is about land back. But really, in the practice of struggle and the practice of of being with one another, in the practice of solidarity, um, we start to to work through some of that, right? And and that's the the thing that I don't think, um, you know, including myself, books don't capture that relational ethic as much as we try. <laughs> um, that's forged in struggle, um, and I think that's what's that's what's really important, and that's what's hugely informed my work, right, is, you know, seeing, for example, the Palestinian flag flying at the Six Nations blockade 10 years ago, um, or seeing a refugees welcome banner flying in sovereign with Soweton territories, or, you know, being part of welcoming ceremonies when Tamil refugees were detained, including children in a youth detention center, and there was, you know, water welcoming ceremonies to welcome them by Suela Tooth elders, you know, all of those acts of reciprocity 
I think are, are what uh, enact that relationship um, and kind of, again, melt away those, those seeming contradictions because we realize that our, our struggles are similar in many ways, different in many ways, but that we are fundamentally trying to create a world where we respect um, Indigenous sovereignty and we also think about home in an expansive way that's not built in exploitation and expropriation. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, because it's an excellent point, and there's a lot to flesh out there. Like, I have two questions, like as a follow-up question. The first is that, you know, you, you mentioned Shannon Speed's uh, work in thinking about Latin American nations or countries as settler states, and they're typically not viewed as settler states. And so I was wondering, uh, uh, you know, one question would be, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I don't think people quite understand what that means. And then secondly... You know, you were talking about, um, you know, all of these uh, land-based struggles and how, you know, they had this capaciousness of, uh, you know, exercising sovereignty, not based on mm -hmm. exclusion, but based on like inclusion of, of difference. And it brings me back to this quote uh, that Emily Riddle, she, she wrote about the indigenous sovereignties, the overlapping indigenous sovereignties and jurisdictions that exist in the prairies in so-called Canada. And she wrote, European political traditions would have us believe that being sovereign means asserting exclusive control over a territory. Whereas prairie Indian political traditions teach us that is, it is through our relationship with others that we are sovereign, that sharing is not a sign of weakness, but of ultimate strength and mm. diplomacy. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I, you know, to the the first question in terms of Shannon Speed's um, work and and others um, like Shannon's great work uh, is, you know, really just the context of Spanish colonization is often erased when we're talking about parts of Latin America, right? And of course, that's that's the reality. Um, we tend to focus a lot on Euro colonization, or I should say, Anglo colonization, because of the nature of uh, the aftermath of that, right? And, and the fact that the U.S., for example, is, is the epicenter in many ways of, of empire for the, for the past few decades. But for indigenous peoples, of course, colonization in the Latin American context is very much real. And, you know, many of, of the massacres, if we even in the kind of more contemporary era during the civil war in Guatemala, for example, you know, those who were largely uh, targeted during the genocide under the Reagan era in Guatemala were Maya people. Um, and that's, you know, also true if we look at the kind of forced impoverishment and land theft that continues in Honduras uh, against indigenous people um, and Garifuna communities. And so, you know, again, it's, it's operating in a different context um, in relationship to the nation state of the United States, uh, who continues to, of course, suppress um, the su suppress legitimate movements for democracy in Latin America. Of course, Bolivia coming coming to mind right away. Um, but that doesn't erase the fact uh, that there are indigenous communities still fighting for self determination, fighting for sovereignty, and fighting against the policies of the center um, in those countries. Right, Chile, Bolivia. Um, continue to have just vibrant and important and mass-based indigenous movements, um, you know, South Mexico, just everywhere. Um, and so that is something that we uh, need to tend to when we're thinking about settler colonial context, right? That it's, it's not limited to the U.S. and Canada. And those contours may look different um, depending on the, the, the configuration of power in those nation states. But the, the reality of conquest is one that's undeniable. Yeah, in terms of, you know, the question of the, the capaciousness, as you put it so beautifully, of Indigenous sovereignty. And, you know, of course, I, I don't want to in any way romanticize or flatten or assume a kind of pan-Indigenous view on what Indigenous sovereignty or nationhood may look like. And, you know, those are being contested in, in many ways, um, including by formerly enslaved people. But... Um, I do think that in my experience, I have absolutely witnessed it um, as capacious. And, you know, for a brief period of time when I was fighting the Canadian state uh, and was fighting against a removal order personally, um, I was always offered 
protection and refuge by indigenous nations. And, you know, and that's again, why for me, this is just, it's a profound act. It's just my, it's my responsibility. I can't imagine anything else because that's what was offered to me. Right. And, you know, Wolverine, the political prisoner, a former political prisoner and an elder who has who's passed away, but whose, you know, legacy lives on. When he found out about that, he, you know, started looking uh, and unearthing the immigration policy of his nation. Um, and, you know, one of his relatives, Neski Manuel and Skahish Manuel, they started looking into that as well, right? And saying, oh, what, what, what was our immigration policy look like? Like, how could someone enter into our nation if not, you know, if not adoption or marriage, right? Were there other ways you could be part of the community, um, even if you weren't formally part of a family? And so those acts of care and relationality, as you and Emily have talked about, those acts of thinking about nationhood in a way of, of offering refuge, which the, you know, the Canadian state purports to offer, but does not, you know, those are profound acts of kindness, really, right? At, at its heart, it's a profound act of kindness and care, and means especially so when these are communities who are bearing the brunt of centuries of violence, who are surviving, who are, you know, fighting the daily grind of settler violence and yet have the time to offer someone like me that care that that just at an intimate level means a profound amount. And you go, again, it stands in contrast to the billions and billions of, of dollars worth of resources that the Canadian state has that it doesn't put towards care, obviously, doesn't put towards refuge, but in fact uses, you know, all of its resources, of course to oppress and to violate and to detain and deport. So, you know, those are, those are for me some ways in which I've, I've been a, a, a recipient of that reciprocity. I mean, I don't know how one is a recipient of reciprocity. That's almost, it almost doesn't make sense, but, you know, been able to be in those, in those ways of, of relational care and, and seeing sovereignty enacted in those ways that, that you and Emily are talking about most certainly. Right. And that solidarity, I think, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before we hit record about um, the importance of solidarity, especially when it comes to pushing back against um, these eco-fascist mm. tendencies that we see popping up. And so you conclude your book with a discussion on eco-fascism and the liberal agendas that will posture themselves as being benevolent, but these climate policies that liberals push are actually rooted in ongoing settler colonial projects be it the reinforcement of terra nullis by asserting that stolen lands are public lands or blaming migration for the environmental catastrophes that capitalism and imperialism are responsible for. So how do you see these native movements and solidarity movements challenging these eco-fascist tendencies moving forward? Yeah, thank you for, for mentioning that because, you know, I'm, I am increasingly, I mean, of course, we're all aware of the ways in which you know, the continuous rise of the right is a reality. And again, you know, the Biden being president and his, his victory in the election does not in any way mean that the far right is receding in terms of, you know, on the ground, what the impact and the growth of far right movements is. And especially if we look at it nationally, if we're looking at India, looking at Israel, looking at Europe, um, looking at other places around the world, which is part of what this book traces is, you know, the, um, the transnational networks. And, you know, layered on top of that is this not new trend, but this, again, escalating trend of eco-fascism. And, you know, the Christchurch killer, uh, you know, kind of went off about how immigration is environmental warfare. And, you know, the El Paso uh, killer talked about how, you know, we can't, we have to get rid of enough people so our way of life can become more sustainable. So there's been this thread of eco-fascism um, where kind of, you know, birth rates and immigration and food scarcity have all been weaponized to, to further the far right um, racist white supremacist agenda, right? And really at its, uh, what kind of undergirds it is this eugenicist kind of model and this kind of lifeboat theory. Um, and, you know, it's kind of fueled by apocalyptic nihilism and race war fantasies, right? Like these ideas that we that if we're going to make it, we have to get rid of a whole bunch of people and a select few, the pure race uh, will kind of guard the earth. Um, and this is really quite prominent, especially in, in Europe and this kind of green nationalism. And, you know, even like last year or the year before, I don't remember the exact year, but 
you know, Marine Le Pen, who is one of the most well-known far-right figures um, in Europe, right, in France, uh, she actually has recently started campaigning on a kind of weird, messed up, eco- I mean, weird is a, a bit of an understatement, but um, a really violent ecological kind of localism where she compares immigrants to foreign invasive species, you know, and she said that, quote, you know, borders are the environment's greatest ally. It is through borders that we will save the planet, right? Um, so again, this kind of ecofascism and the escalation of border militarism um, through this kind of screed. And, uh, you know, this is incredibly dangerous, right? Because we can see the ways in which environmental organizations um, have latched on. I mean, many, thankfully, have denounced these kinds of strands within the environmental movement, uh, but others have latched onto it. And, you know, there's been a really troubling history, right? Even until the 90s, the Sierra Club, um, you know, had a really kind of anti-migrant strand in it. Uh, Eco-fascist pioneer Madison Grant was a renowned conservationist, right? (laughs) Um, And wanted to, you know, preserve and and, uh, conserve the environment. And even you know, in a kind of generalizing way, the conservationist movement has been deeply colonial, if not outright eco-fascist, but been deeply, um, deeply colonial, because the idea of conservation and preserving lands, as if though indigenous peoples don't live and use those lands, is an act of terra nullius, right? The it perpetuates the idea of barren land. Um, and we've seen that, you know, in environmental moves for conservation, here in Canada, the kind of environmental movement to ban the seal hunt, um, you know, so many of those kinds of um, moves or, you know, to um, put land, force, um, you know, green spaces and conservation spaces that remove Indigenous peoples from being able to access those lands um, and to, you know, collect uh, medicines, practice food sovereignty, practice ceremony and more. And so there's this, uh, this way in which eco-fascism is, is both anti-migrant in terms of escalating border militarism, and also then conversely, we're not with eco-fascism, but also mainstream environmentalism is uh, often deeply anti-indigenous um, in terms of its kind of barren land uh, kind of theorizing. Um, and really, you know, just imagining the environment as a kind of like white space, right? Um, that environmentalism is for white people and it's a space of whiteness uh, that one just kind of goes into to enjoy. And so, um, you know, the ways in which we fight back ecofascism, I think, is, you know, to call for open borders, right? The call for open borders and actually no borders, in my view, especially in this era of climate crisis. Um, and, you know, climate crisis that is fueled by imperialism. I'm not talking about climate crisis like Elon Musk style, you know, techno solutionism. I'm talking about an understanding of the climate crisis as being fueled by imperialism and capitalism. And, you know, the military industrial complex, you know, that 100 corporations in the world are responsible for 71% of our global emissions, you know, that kind of climate crisis analysis. Um, so if we are to, you know, if we are to respond to that kind of climate crisis, it is a form of eco-fascism to say that the, you know, the majority of the world's people who are being displaced as a result of climate crisis just have to drown or just have to be swallowed into the water or just have to, you know, be burnt alive in fires. That is a form of eco-fascism. Um, we have to be able to say that people, um, that there should be no borders, that, you know, that in the in this era of climate catastrophe, people have to be able to move. Um, and on the flip side, we have to also actually fight the climate crisis, right? We have to defend the earth. We have to end the capitalist extraction of land. And that absolutely means standing alongside indigenous land defenders who are the front line, absolutely the front line of defending the planet. Um, You know, Ariel Derange talks about this often, which is, you know, just looking at the long lineage of indigenous land defense and how, you know, I I remember her for, you know, for 20 years, constantly in her talks, talking about how indigenous people um, are less than 5% of the world's population, but steward 80% of the planet's biodiversity, 
And so not only most acutely experience the impacts of industrial genocide, but also are on the front line of fighting industrial genocide. Um, And so I think that is the other key way in which we fight eco-fascism or mainstream environmental liberalism is to refuse that kind of neoliberal or outright fascist approach and instead to say no, right? We stand with indigenous land defenders. And this is also incredibly important for unions to take up. And I know, Nick, you and I have chatted about this in the past, um, you know, which is that oftentimes the kind of white working class, um, which is, you know, a, a weird construction in itself, but the white working class will see itself in opposition to indigenous land defenders. And, um, you know, indigenous land defense is just not seen as uh, as seen as a form of work when in fact it is, you know, what some of the work that I've been doing with unions is to say, hey, you know, their unions would never cross a picket line and unions should never and union members should never cross a blockade because a blockade is a form of a picket line. It is indigenous people resisting the exploitation and the extraction of capitalism. And it is a form of work, right? Land defense is a form of work. It is a form of labor. It is beyond, it exceeds the rubric of work, but it includes it. Um, And so it is so important to understand Indigenous land defense as generative labor and to express solidarity with Indigenous blockades as picket lines. Um, And that, to me, is is a much more profound way of building solidarity than kind of mainstream neoliberal environmentalism. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I just love the way you constantly remind us that, um, you know, migrant issues can't, you know, aren't just migrant issues. It's, you know, it's a matter of class struggle always. And um, I think that's just incredibly, an incredibly important analysis that gets overlooked when we're having these conversations, sometimes even amongst ourselves as organizers. So I had one follow up that's <laughs> kind of silly and it's kind of um, continuing um, the topic that we've been having through our last couple of podcasts, but um, so this this QAnon shaman, this ridiculous figure, Jake and Jelly, um, has almost become like representative of this convergence of these, you know, liberal tendencies and, you know, ultra far right tendencies where, um, you know, eco fascism is is taken up right all around. Um, you know, he's like demanding organic food in jail and, um, you know, claims to live this like earth based life yet he is like this this symbol for rising white supremacy now so i was just wondering like what do you make of figures like this um kind of like representing this this convergence um where eco fascism is something that is being taken up by both liberals and and the far right yeah it's a it's a it's a great question and i do not know this figure i confess but I get a glimpse. <laughs> you are clearly, missing out on so much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hitting up Google right after. Um, <laughs> we did a whole we did a whole podcast. Oh episode my god! On. <laughs> Can't wait to hear it. Um, yeah, I mean, you you hit the nail on the head, right? Which is that this kind of eco fascism, uh, as you're talking about, Jen, it it can be taken up by liberals and it folds into a liberal and neoliberal ideology. And then it also, um, you know, dovetails into a far right ideology and they may look slightly different, but in essence, they're the same. Um, And I think, you know, it's not a, it's not a coincidence because really any and all uh, progressive movements have been co-opted Uh, by the by liberals and the far right in many ways, right? Like, the the same thing has and continues to happen to feminism. Um, You know, if we think about the kind of representational politics of feminism that liberals love, um, which is the politics of like, you know, um, women, uh, women leaders, women politicians, women bosses, women heads of state, women cops, <laughs> all of that. Yeah. Um, or, you know, gender responsive prisons. <laughs> We're not going to abolish prisons. We'll just have, you know, better prisons for women. Um, and then, of course, right wing. Woke, woke, woke prisons. prisons. Yeah. <laughs> and, and there you go, right? And then the kind of more far right attacks on on feminism, right? The kind of more traditional fam, quote unquote family values uh, attack on feminism, which is less a co optation and an overt attack. And I think um, that's the same thing from what you've described about this dude. Uh, 
Um, and but beyond that, that we see in terms of the ways in which um, green politics works, right, the kind of greenwashing um, and greenwashing exactly that, right? Like, oh, OK, like, yeah, we just we need more organic farms. But the migrant workers who work on these organic farms that we're going to sell at the farmer's market get paid two dollars an hour. Right. Like for farm workers, migrant farm workers, there's no difference between the organic farm and the pesticide farm when it comes to their wages and their working conditions. Right. Um, And, you know, of course, many of the the major um, organic food companies are also notorious for being union busters in their supply chain and their grocery workers or, you know, as you've said, you know, organic food in prisons. Um, And then we also have the kind of more outright greenwashing, the kind of green militarism, um, which is, you know, you may recall that uh, the U.S. military announced, I think it was about a year ago, that it was going to like green its killing machine, right? <laughs> the, the envir- it, it implemented a number yeah. of kind of, envi- it, envi- it implemented an environmental policy. And it's like, that's absurd, right? Like you can't green the largest purveyor of violence until you abolish the violence. Um, so, and of course. Also, you know, Biden, Biden has actually just like this last week committed to turning the entire federal fleet, which includes border patrol oh. vehicles into oh electric God. vehicles. There you go. So, right. Yeah. So right? <laughs> like such bullshit. Um, but people eat that shit up. Right. And it's, and it's, um, you know, but again, it's like, it's not an anomaly. It's like a a long trend of, of co-opting, uh, co-opting struggles, um, to make these kind of gestures, um, to reform, reform the state to, and, you know, to have the state reconfigure, um, it's some of its practices, but of course its pillars remain the same. And we see that in, in so many different ways. So in that sense, I, I don't, you know, what I make of it is that it's like more of the same bullshit, really. <laughs> um, where can people find your work and what's the best, you know, if there's any, you know, movements or things that you want to plug, where can people find that? Um, I will, I will run out of tape if I, if I plug anything and then I will also <laughs> be kicking myself for forgetting some for forgetting something and or some comrades. So I will refrain from commenting there, but um, I'm on, I'm on Twitter land mostly personally. Um, and that's where I will plug the things <laughs> that I and others are involved in um, and border and rule for folks listening from the so-called United States is available uh, from Haymarket with a f- just fire, uh, afterward by Nick, as he mentioned, um, and that it's currently 30% off. So if you're so inclined, uh, feel free to pick it up. I'm also happy to email anyone um, if you want a digital copy and, you know, just don't have the scroll to buy it. Um, but yeah, that that's where I am. And that's where the book is. 